hey, New City. Good morning. So glad to be with you as we worship together. My name is Dylan. I'm here with Abby, and we're going to be your co-host for today. We're so excited you're watching this video with us. Feel free to like it, share it, comment your favorite part. And if you want to know more about us, you can follow us on any social media platform at New City RDU. Abby, what is your favorite color? Purple. Purple. Yes. I like green. I also like green. You I like got green nervous too? and uh, didn't know what to say. What? <laughs> so then I said purple, but my favorite color is actually green. What? what? That's not something to be embarrassed about. <laughs> well, I was scared. Okay, you well. Me. It's, I feel like that's a hard question. That's there something are lots that you of can colors. comment too. You can tell us your favorite color, but your actual favorite color. Uh, but anyway, this morning we're going to sing some songs. We're going to hear some scripture being read. We're going to continue our series in Colossians, and then we will conclude with one more song of worship. Yeah, so feel free to join us in worship, um, whether that be sitting and just meditating on the words or singing as loud as you can for your neighbors to hear. We like one of those options better, and it's being loud and letting your neighbors know what you're doing. Hey, New City family, we're so glad that you can join us online to worship this morning. We're going to go ahead and get right into it and worship our King.
This reading is from Isaiah 64, verses 4 through 8. From ancient times, no one has heard, no one has listened to, no eye has seen any God except you, who acts on behalf of the one who waits for him. You welcome the one who joyfully does what is right. They remember you in your ways. But we have sinned, and you were angry. How can we be saved if we remain in our sins? All of us have become like something unclean, and all our righteous acts are like a polluted garment. All of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities carry us away like the wind. No one calls on your name, striving to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and made us melt because of our iniquity. Yet, Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We all are the work of your hands. In my mother's womb, you formed me with your hand, known and loved by you. Before I took a breath, when I doubted, Lord, remind me, I'm wonderful in me. You're an artist and a potter, I'm the canvas and the clay, as you make all. There's a healing light just beyond the clouds. Though I walk through fire, I see clearly now. I know nothing has been wasted, no failure or mistake. Cause you're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay. Cause you'll make a And for my good, you make 
Well, good morning, New City. Um, it's, it's so great to be with you online this morning. This is, this is a first for me, um, preaching to a camera versus a live audience. And so maybe after this, I'll be able to tell you what's easiest. I've seen all on Twitter that like preaching to a camera versus uh, a room full of people is actually harder. And so we'll just see when we get to the end of this, which was easier and which was tougher. Um, but regardless, wherever you are viewing from, we are so glad that you've joined us this morning as we continue in our study through the book of Colossians, Jesus over everything. And I want to start with a story this morning, and I have to ask you before I start, because what are some things that you avoid? Like, what are some things, um, you know, as you go throughout life, what are some things that you just, you're not comfortable dealing with, you want to kind of sidestep these things? And maybe you're thinking of, of very serious things. Maybe you're thinking of a memory in your past that was just very traumatic, something that you don't like thinking about. But for me, when I ask this question, I immediately think of sad TV shows or sad movies. I can't stand to watch a TV show, a movie, listen to music that invokes this emotion of sadness. And so if there's a bully in the movie, if there's um, a divorce in the TV show, if there's something where the characters are going through pain, I feel it on another level. And so I was, I was thinking about this, that, that how much I don't like these types of TV shows. And I'm reminded of a time, um, actually very recent, just a few months ago, where me and Emily, my wife, were visiting um, our in-laws. And Emily and her mother had gone to the store for something. They had either gone to Target or the grocery store or something. And I was sitting downstairs watching TV with Emily's dad. He had the remote, so we were watching whatever he wanted to watch, which was no big deal. But I remember him sitting there in his recliner, going through the channel guide, and hitting a dog's purpose. Now, I had never seen this movie, and I don't know if you have. You can probably drop that in the comments if you've seen A Dog's Purpose, because if you have seen this movie, you know where I'm going. But I remember him clicking on this movie, and I'm like, I think I remember this movie being about all the dogs that, like, die and then come back to life, right? Like, is that a happy movie? I don't know if that's a good thing, like, oh, they're back to life, or if it's really sad, but I do remember texting Emily, and I want to give you just a little look, a glimpse into our text conversation as Emily's dad turned this on. So this is actually what was happening during that time. So my texts are in the blue, Emily's texts are in the white. I texted her, your dad turned on a dog's purpose with seven crying faces. Oh no, that movie is so sad. Me, I'm literally going to go do something. I can't watch this. And this is Emily knowing me. You should, I'm not even kidding, that movie will wreck you. I saw it after Gup died, which we had a dog die shortly after marriage. And I said, okay, the police dog is about to jump into the river. She said, OMG, that's so sad. Look away, just ask him to change it. To at this point, he just goes upstairs. And I'm like, do I change it? The man put on this movie, like I don't want him to come back down and I changed it. And I said, he went upstairs. Well, the dog just died. This is the saddest thing ever. Cop is literally crying over his dead dog. Those were the 10 minutes that I saw of a dog's purpose, and it was awful. I hate watching movies like that, and I just avoid them. And so I start with that story this morning because this is the question we're going to be looking at as we continue through the book of Colossians. Is following Jesus simply about avoiding bad things? Is following Jesus, just like I avoid sad or, 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 or bad TV shows, is it just about sidestepping those things? Because certainly there are things that good Christians do and don't do, right? Well, this is what Paul is going to um, kind of talk about a little bit as we continue our study. And he swim, somewhat dives into this question as we get into an actual issue that is happening in this church in the book of Colossians. You see, a sort of heresy, which is just teaching that is not orthodox, teaching that we do not agree with, has crept into the church, and there is a leader, while it is not named, he is not named, Paul gives us some descriptions of what is happening, and it lends this question, okay, well, if that's not what following Jesus is about, these things that this false teacher is teaching, then what is following Jesus about? Some background as you're turning to Colossians will be in Colossians chapter 2, looking at verses 16 through 23. And as you're turning there or pulling it up on your phone or computer, Colossians was written in about A.D. 62 and written by this guy named Paul. Now, because of that date, A.D. 62, we're pretty sure that Paul was writing Colossians while he was in prison. But above that, we, we don't know too, too much about it, but we see this huge theme throughout the book of Colossians, which we'll continue with today that Christ is preeminent. 
that Christ is above all, he is over all. And so whether Paul was sitting in prison or he wasn't, this theme runs throughout the book that Christ is everything. And that theme is going to be so important today because like I said, as we introduce these heresies, we're going to look at that question, what does it look like for Christ to be in all and through all when things are entering into our lives that are not helpful and go against everything we believe in? And so that's where we'll be starting today, verse 16 of chapter two, let's, let's read along. Therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food and drink or in the matter of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, verse 17. These are a shadow of what was to come The substance is Christ. Now, I'm not going to do the Christian joke. When we find a therefore in um, the passage, we, we automatically say, what is it there for? But we do have to look back to what we saw last week to really get a glimpse of why Paul is addressing this heresy and what the gospel actually teaches. Last week, our bottom line was that salvation is received, not achieved. You see, the verses before this walk us through what Christ had done through his burial, his death, and his resurrection, and how now that we are centered in Christ, that we are in Christ, Paul is starting this section with this this imperative, this command to not let anyone judge you in regard to your food and drink, in the matter of a festival or a new moon, or in a Sabbath day. You see, these three things take our minds back to what any God-fearing, law-abiding Jew would in the Old Testament. You see, there were festivals that God's people were commanded to uphold. There was the Sabbath day in which you would do nothing but rest. And there were also these these new months where we would bring forth our burnt offerings, our new offerings. And so when, when Paul says, don't let anyone judge you concerning a festival or a new moon, while that may seem super confusing, like what does that even mean? A new moon is simply symbolizing a new month in which we would bring our offering before God. Now, what is the issue with this? Because outright, these things are not bad. The law is not evil. The things that the Old Testament Israelites did are not wrong in itself. But because we have been hidden in Christ, which he says right before these verses, we cannot allow these things to be added on top of the gospel. You see, it's not that Jesus um, nailed our sins to the cross, and so we must bring our offerings every new moon, or in regard to our food and drink and our Sabbath, do these things No, Paul is saying do not add on to the gospel. And in fact, he he goes a little bit further in verse 17 where he says this, if you'll look back with me. These are a shadow of what was to come. The substance is Christ. You see, these Old Testament rituals were always a shadow of what was happening. Just as if I was walking down the sidewalk on a sunny day and I looked down and I saw my shadow, I know that that shadow is not actually me, right? It's a shadow of the reality of my body walking down the sidewalk. In the same way, Paul is saying, do not add on to the gospel with these things. Maybe we could phrase it like this. That following Jesus is not about being religious. You see, if we're not careful, we can reduce our Christianity to going to church, listening to the right music, or watching the right movies. Of course, not sad movies. We can reduce our Christianity down to those things. And it's not that there is no benefit of going to church. It's not that there's no benefit of of, of listening to Christian music. I love Christian music. But what Paul is saying is those things are not the substance. Think about it like this. One of my favorite restaurants, if we were going specifically fast food, so maybe not restaurants, but if we were looking at fast food, is cookout. One of the greatest things about North Carolina is the invention of cookout. And cookout is a place where you can get a cookout tray for a very cheap price. It's quick, it's delicious. You can get your corn dog while you're eating a chicken fajita. It's all these great things, right? You can add a cheer wine, but there is no substance behind it, right? It tastes good, but it certainly does not do the same thing for your body as a well balanced meal. And in the same way, religion fills you up, but Jesus delivers substance. Do we want to read our Bible? Yes. Do we want to pray? Do we want to fast? Do we want to do the externals that point us to Jesus? Yes. But those things are done in an overflow of our time with Jesus. And so Paul is starting our section with saying, don't let anyone judge you 
If you are not doing these things or if you are not putting these things on top of your belief in the Lord. And so that is one false belief that has entered into the church. That is it about being religious? Let's keep reading as Paul dives in to a little bit of deeper heretical teaching that has entered the church. Now, verses 18 in chapter 2. Let no one condemn you. So he's kind of starting this language just like he did in verse 16. Let no one condemn you by delighting in aesthetic practices and the worship of angels, claiming access to a visionary realm. Such people are inflated by empty notions of their unspiritual minds. He doesn't hold on to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and tendons, grows with growth from God. Let no one condemn you. What is Paul saying let no one condemn you for? Because some of these terms within this passage might be a little bit confusing, and so let's break them down a little bit. The first thing that Paul says let no one condemn you for is by delighting in aesthetic practices. You see, aestheticism, that's a funny word. Aestheticism is the practice of denying yourself of worldly things in order to rise above spiritually. And so it's essentially surface level, just purging yourself, whether that's through bodily harm, penance of if I can just punish my flesh enough, then I will rise above and the lust of the flesh will no longer have a hold on me. The second thing Paul says let no one condemn you for is the, the, the worship of angels. Within this, you would have some people that that have entered into the Colossian church, and they're invoking the protection of angels. So it's not just the worship bowing down to angels like we would think, but it's more looking for the protection of angels, accessing the spiritual realm, right, where angels are. And it's very interesting that as Paul describes these practices and describes the leader that has brought them in, this is what he says at the end of verse 18, that such people who do these things are inflated by empty notions of their unspiritual mind. Once again, he he brings us to this contradiction that while these things seem like they would be profitable, while these things seem like they're, they're good ideas, look at verse 19. He doesn't hold on to the head. Speaking to the leader, this this figure who has brought these things in, he doesn't hold on to the head from whom the whole body nourished and held together by its ligaments and tendons grows with the growth of God. You see, this specific leader doesn't teach Jesus because he doesn't know Jesus. He's not holding on to Jesus as Paul describes Jesus as the head of the whole body. You and me are the body and that is what we hold on to. And so the issue here is that the Colossians buy into the notion about what does it look like to worship angels, to um, buy into these aesthetic practices, the spirituals, if you will. We run into the issue where one another doesn't do the same gifts. And so say one person in this church or, or a group in this church is very good, right, at the purging of themselves. They're beating their bodies. They're, they're, they're praying that the lust of the flesh would be conquered. And then others are looking at them saying, well, I don't do that. I don't do that as well as them. Well, John told me the other day that he in, invoked the worship of angels. He invoked the protection of angels. And he had access and saw some crazy visions. But I didn't have those visions. You see, that's the issue when we jump into these spiritual things, that we are not all the same in these. And I don't want to say that I have experience in visions, right? I haven't invoked the protection or the spiritual realm of angels, but I do know something about visions versus reality. If you know me well, you know that I have a terrible habit of sleepwalking. Now, I don't know if it's a habit because I didn't actually ask to do it, and obviously I would want it to stop. But three out of, you know, three nights out of the week, I am literally walking around my apartment, seeing things on me and Emily's bed. And even the other week, I was trying to lift up the dresser. I woke up around 2 a.m. to Emily shouting, Adam, 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 what are you doing? As I was literally trying to get under the dresser to pick it up. I remember one time in college, because literally this has been happening for years, I pictured these bugs all over my bedspread. So I ran out of my college apartment and threw my pillow and bedspread out into the yard, came back in, laid down to my roommate asking, Adam, did you just throw all of your bedding out into the yard? You see, when I wake up, I realize this isn't reality. The things that I see trying to lift my dresser for whatever reason, talking to my pillow, which I did a few nights ago, Emily reminded me of, they are not reality. They're just vision. 
And so here Paul is simply reminding us once again that while these things seem like spiritual and they seem like they would puff us up and they would make us better Christians, they are not reality. The substance is once again Jesus. And so following Jesus is not about being religious. And here we see that following Jesus is not about being spiritual. Jesus never called us to be spiritual, doing enough in hopes that we can get a glimpse of him, purging ourselves through penance, invoking spiritual visions. These things are rooted in what can I do for God? And worse, what can I do to get to God? What can I do to get to God? And remember these words of Paul's in 2 Corinthians 12, where if anybody could brag of visions, if anybody could brag on the spiritual realms that he has seen, it was Paul, and he recounts this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul says, boasting is necessary. It is not profitable, but I will move on to the visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ, he's talking about himself, who was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether he was in the body or out of the body, I don't know, God knows. I know that this man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a human being is not allowed to speak. I will boast about this person, but not about myself, except of my weaknesses. For if I want to boast, I wouldn't be a fool because I would be telling the truth. But I will spare you so that no one can credit me with something beyond what he sees in me or hears from me, especially because of the extraordinary revelations. Therefore, so that I would not exalt myself, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, to torment me so that I would not exalt myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it would leave me. And then verse 9. But he said to me, the Lord said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecution, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Want to talk about visions? Want to talk about the spiritual realities of the things unseen? Paul literally was taken to heaven and said that he saw things and heard things that no one can express in human words or emotions. But nevertheless, did we notice what the Lord responded to with, with, responded with Paul in this, this verse? That his boasting will not be in his visions, but his boastings will be in his weakness. His boasting will not be in his spirituality, but he will be boasting in the thorn in the side of his flesh. Boast in Jesus, boast in your weaknesses, because Paul unlocks a treasure here that we too must unlock. That it is not in being religious or being spiritual, but it is actually in our weaknesses that we see the power and revelation of Jesus. And so if it's not about being spiritual and it's not about being religious, then what is following Jesus all about? And in that regard, we finish this section looking at verses 20 through 23. If you died with Christ to the elements of this world, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to the regulations don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? All these regulations refer to what is destined to perish by being used up. They are of human commands and doctrine. Although these have a reputation for wisdom by promoting self-made religion, false humility, and severe treatment of the body, they are not of any value in curbing self-indulgence. How do we know if we have been hidden in Christ? How do we know if we are saved? Verse 20, Paul tells us, if you have died with Christ... You see, these Colossians were believers. They were followers of Jesus that were also possibly had the temptation of following these heresies and listening to these things. And so Paul is simply reminding them of who they are. And he's not asking this question as if they're not Christians. He's asking them this question like, do you realize that you died with Christ? Do you remember what it was like when salvation came to you? How do we know if we are saved? if we have died to Christ. And this is the gospel. 
That, that, that Jesus asks us to give nothing up but ourselves. Galatians 2.20 says this, For I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith and in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We are partakers in Christ's death, dying to the things of this world, the lusts of our flesh, so that we may also be partakers in his resurrection in this life and be made like him in the end. You see, the gospel is completely contrary to what the world offers. And what does the world offer? Look again at verse 21. Don't handle, don't taste, do not touch. You see, the gospel is not about what you cannot do anymore. The gospel is about the, the life that we have found, not with rules and regulations of God saying, don't do this, do this. Read your Bible, don't listen to secular music. That's not what the gospel is. The gospel is that Jesus gives us freely and it's only contingent upon us dying to ourselves and accepting his gift of life. It is in this death of self that we find life. And that is the message that Paul is saying in here. Do not fall back into that. Do not fall back into that as tempting as they are. As tempting as they are to fall back into these practices where I have to see what I can do to get on God's good side and what I can do to get closer to God, Paul says this about those things in verse 23. Look again. Although these things have a reputation for wisdom, by promoting self-made religion, false humility, and severe treatment of the body, they are not of any value in curbing self-indulgence. These things have a reputation Maybe they're not beneficial deep down below, but on the surface, it really seems like if I could invoke the spiritualities of angels, if I could invoke the protection of angels, if I could just bring my offering before God every new moon at the beginning of every month, every Sunday, if I could just bring my offering of my good works to God, then he would love me, and this is what following Jesus is about. That is very tempting on the surface. But above all, that is not the message of Colossians, that is not the message of Paul, and that is not the message of the gospel. And so as we look at this passage today, I think we could really summarize the message of Paul, the message of Colossians, and ultimately the message of the gospel in this, that following Jesus is about becoming more like Jesus. Following Jesus is not about being religious. Following Jesus is not about being or acting or looking spiritual. But following Jesus is about becoming more like him in every aspect of our life. You see, in this dying to self, in this Jesus, may I decrease and you increase, may we be more concerned about our love over our spirituality, our generosity over our religious practices, and all around us in this life, there is this pressure that we must do more and we must be better. Whether that's in your work, that at work you feel like you have to perform in order to get that promotion, you have to cut corners in order to um, get that pay raise. Maybe at home you feel like you're lacking as a husband or as a wife or as a parent, and there's this pressure all around you to do more and be better. I mean, think about this quarantine as we look at social media, and maybe you're like me and you see other people's posts and you recognize, man, they are making so much more out of their quarantine time than I am. I mean, this parent seems to have it all together. This husband is doing everything for his wife. These churches are doing things so much better than my church. There is this pressure all around us to do more and be better. But following Jesus does not have to be that way with us. There will be a temptation, just as these Colossians have entered into in this passage, that when things come our way so that we may look more religious, when things come our way so that we can seem more spiritual, we will give in to those things and actually add on to the gospel. One of my deepest insecurities is my performance. One of my deepest insecurities and one of the things that I struggle with almost on a daily basis is this idea that if I am not performing, if I am not proving my worth as a student, as a, a pastor on staff, as a husband, then what am I doing? There are literally some Sundays where I will preach or I will even just do next steps, which are our announcements. And in the back of my head, I'm thinking, I didn't even pray this week. What are you doing up here? There is this pressure to do more or be better. And if I'm not careful, my heart will bend towards following Jesus is about looking religious, looking spiritual, when honestly, Jesus is just asking us to follow him 
that over time and in love and in grace, we will be more like him. And listen to me. You will blow it. I will blow it. I will make someone upset. I will say things I didn't mean to. I will cut someone off in traffic. I will yell at the person that cut someone off, uh, cut me off in traffic. And I will still look outside of myself to fill this void that the gospel looks to fill each and every morning. And when those things occur, and we recognize that, man, my life isn't exactly what I wanted it to be, that man following Jesus, I, I, I haven't prayed this week, I haven't done my quiet time as much as I would like to, when we hit that point and we recognize that, going back to religion does not help us. Going back to spirituality and trying to fill ourselves up with those things do not help us. At the end of the day, we go back to Jesus. We go back to Jesus just as Paul is instructing these Colossians to do. And so remember, following Jesus is about becoming more like Jesus. All these things that we are doing externally, they are merely a shadow for the substance that is within us. And if you are in Christ, if you have died with Christ, you are a follower of Jesus. You are a son. You are a daughter. And that is what we go back to at the end of the day. And so I am praying for you, I am praying for myself and our temptation and our bend to go towards the external religious actions that good Christians do because that is the temptation of our heart. And so above all, as we continue our study through the book of Colossians and we're entering into chapter three next week, we remember this, that Jesus is over everything. And the bottom line for today is that following Jesus is about becoming more like Jesus because he is over all and he will get us through our next hours, our next minutes, our next days. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you that you are truly above all. And Jesus, because you love us and because you have given yourself for us, we do not have to look to the external things of this world. Jesus, because you are above all, you call us not to purge ourselves through um, mutilating our flesh God, you don't call us to beat ourselves up when our Mondays didn't go as planned. God, when we fall back into sin, when we give into temptation, Jesus, you do not call us to invoke the prayers of angels for spiritual protection. Jesus, you call us to simply get back up and follow you again, that we would pick up our doubts, that we would pick up our fears, that we would pick up all these external things that grip our heart, and that, Jesus, that we would follow you even more closely because you are over all and you are doing something in our lives. And so, Jesus, in our temptation to look outside ourselves to prove ourselves to you or get closer to you, may you gently remind us that it's not about that and that you're calling us to yourselves every single day to follow you in our imperfections and our failings and in our sins. You are beyond gracious, and I thank you for the ways that you are working in my life and in the life of those watching this. Amen. So as we continue with one more song of worship, um, we're going to sing um, this song of blessing over you.
his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and their children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children Well, thanks so much for worshiping again with us today. Abby, how have you been worshiping at home? Do you sing out loud? Do you just listen? How do you do it? I am standing up on my coffee table. My neighbors can hear me. Now, is this like purple is your favorite color, or are you actually doing that? Purple is my favorite color. Wow. So we can't listen to her. I will be honest. With our kid, Christina and I, we've got two kids running around. We're definitely more of the sit and listen, but it's still been really enjoyable. Yeah, so again, you can follow us on any social media platform at New City RDU. And remember, following Jesus is becoming more like Jesus. So, New City Church, you, you are, are sent. sent.